Uh, welcome to the 158th episode of the Crisis Jam, uh, our 988 learning community and our second debate. My name is David Covington. I'm your host for today. I'm with Behavioral Health Link and Recovery Innovations. And we're so thrilled to have Jen Stuber and, and Detective Sabrina Taylor with us. They have been longstanding champions in the space of suicide prevention and crisis intervention. Uh, Jen, founding Forefront, I, I could go on and on. The work you've done with Rep Orwall and Washington State has been so innovative. The first state to fund 988 through legislation, uh, according to Congress. And uh, Detective Taylor with the CIT International Board and having led the CIT program here in Phoenix with uh, some of the most innovative programs in the country. So we're thrilled to be addressing this issue of mental health should come with a police car uh, co-response or no, it shouldn't. Um, we did our first debate last year and Dr. Dave Atkins and Dr. John Draper on AI should be the future of crisis care. And we ask you in the audience what you thought before the debate and after the debate. And we did a, a Likert scale on that. And most of you before the debate were in the middle. I, I don't know about AI. We had some strong voices on the, on the definitely no uh, and a few yeses. Uh, aggregately, we were at a 2.6 on that Likert scale. Somewhere between I don't know and, and no. And the debate moved the audience quite a bit, actually. Uh, we went to a 3.0, but a lot of yeses uh, moved from the don't know, the definitely no, and the no. We even had a few move over to definitely yes. So today, uh, we're going to debate mental health should come with a police car. And again, this is a debate, so we're going to define the boundaries and move to the, to the edges on uh, the question. And we'd ask you to go ahead and start uh, by giving us a baseline. Uh, if you could put in uh, mental health should come with a police car, co-response model, definitely no, no, don't know, not sure, yes, definitely yes. And I'm going to stay on this till we pass 100. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, I'll apologize. We have a new process of registration, and I know many of you were trying to get in this morning, and we got to as many of you as we could with the new authentication process, but hope you'll join. So there's definitely interest in, to, in today's uh, debate. So uh, I'll keep moving and, and certainly have more jump in that poll as they have opportunity. Of course, you can go to talk.crisisnow.com to get the latest information, as well as the newsletter and instructions on registering through our, through our new process. Uh, Jen has been on the show before. Uh, Sabrina has been on the show before. We've had over 400 of you over this last, uh, since 2020, actually. So let us know your ideas for speakers, content, and segments. And I'm going to keep on moving today because we got a lot of content. In the news, uh, this is call or text 988 promotional, but this is not in the United States. This is from British Columbia. Uh, as 988 went live on November 30th in Canada, uh, and we have a network of, of crisis centers. We hope to have them in the learning community soon. Uh, tremendous document and actually a future debate we want to push into is the role of peers in uh, uh, real crisis care. Uh, and the Bazelon Center has done a, a terrific uh, starting point. It's got an amazing bibliography uh, around when there's a crisis call up here. And we'll drop the links in the chat for both of these news articles. Uh, we were talking with uh, Dr. Belina Shaw in the pre-show from SAMHSA addressing the Black youth suicide crisis requires a new approach to licensing clinical social workers. If we're going to make a, an impact on the rising youth uh, suicide rate among uh, African Americans. Uh, we need a workforce, and uh, I think uh, Dr. Shaw will uh, talk a little bit more about that stat article and some of the work that's being done to open those doors to ensure uh, that we're bringing in uh, folks that can can help. Uh, and if you haven't made plans for Friday, February second, a number of us are flying into Salt Lake City on Thursday night and leaving out on Saturday morning for the world premiere of Moving America's Soul on Suicide in partnership with the Huntsman Family Foundation and Tanja Miles, a champion in our crisis jam. Uh, we've actually moved to the uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute. This is a near billion dollar, uh, you can see five tower cancer treatment, cancer research institute funded by the Huntsman's over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we're gonna be in that fourth tower 
which is there. That's David Huntsman looking out uh, at the mountain, a picture that Tanja and I took. Uh, so we hope you'll join us. We've, we've expanded into this theater to have some additional slots. Uh, so uh, we'll drop the link in and you can always uh, outreach Karen Jones. Uh, but we've got over 120 of you who are joining us. Tom Betlock, such a champion of crisis services, leads our Medicaid front and center in the crisis trivia hot seat today. Tom, how long, how long have you been gone from the uh, Medicaid director position? Five years, David, oh my this God, month. Can you believe that? I cannot. So Tom, we're talking co-response, we're talking law enforcement and coordination. CIT was developed in Memphis after a 1987 tragedy involving a young man with mental health issues. And CIT resulted from a collaboration between Shelby County Police, the University of Tennessee, and NAMI, who was really the, the heart and soul of, of that effort. Uh, but here's the question, that original vision of CIT, which of the following was not a premise of Randy DuPont's, Major Sam Cochran's, uh, a, 911 dispatches the closest CIT officer to the scene. So they know where officers are and they dispatch them out to the scene. B, there's a certification of CIT officers via a 40-hour training. D, there are dedicated crisis receiving drop-off centers. Uh, or D, voluntary assignment of a percentage of the force to CIT. So the original premise that there be a voluntary assignment of a percentage of officers. We're going to get you the um, the audience feedback right now. The audience is running away with C. They think the dedicated crisis receiving drop off centers was not a part of that original vision. And the the uh, second most uh, highest answer trailing quite a bit behind is voluntary assignment of a percentage of the force. And then the other two do uh, do have some as well. Want to phone a friend, Tom, or you think uh, you know? Can... I, I told you this in the warm-up, David, that the audience is, you know, usually right on these things. And if Generally, they're gravitating towards the case, Tom. if they're gravitating towards C, you know, at 64%, uh, that's where I'm gonna land as well. I'm going with the audience on this one, David. So uh let's bring on Pat Strode for a minute. And Ron Bruno, thanks so much for bringing Pat in. Pat, you and I were together. Uh, as part of that Georgia uh, CIT board 20 years ago now. Uh, and we developed a common curriculum uh, for uh, that to go through the formal training. In fact, certification, though, is not a thing. And the crisis yeah. receiving centers, it seems unbelievable that they had that vision, gosh, Ron, going back into the late 80s. But that's exactly what law enforcement immediately said. If we're going to solve this, we need the dedicated crisis receiving facilities. Pat, a quick word on uh, the work you've done, but we don't have certification. You do have a curriculum in Georgia, but most states don't have that. Um, yeah, we do have a curriculum um, that we teach statewide. Um, uh, director Vernon Keenan, our former GBI director, saw the vision or had the vision of wanting to make sure that every officer, whether they were in very rural Georgia or in urban Georgia, uh, were receiving the same level of, of, um, of training uh, because they all are responsible for the same thing and have the same risk in terms of liability. So uh, we were able to develop and still have a curriculum that is taught consistently the same way um, throughout the state. Crazy, um, crazy. That's whatever. terrific. Terrific work, Pat. Yeah. And Tom, you know, Arizona was pioneering crisis receiving drop-off centers in 2005 to 2010, but we were 25 years, 15, 20 years late uh, on right. the vision of CIT. So, Tom, great. We're going to get, we're hoping to get back to you, Tom, if I can keep it moving here. Learn something every day, David. Thanks. Well, uh, our quote of the week actually comes from a couple of years ago now, 2021, NRI's Kristen Nalen was reviewing mobile crisis services in Charleston County, South Carolina. And why weren't they being used more? Mobile crisis services took too long to respond. Uh, all of this is grist for our first crisis jam debate on mental health should come with a police car, the co-responder model. Now we've been marketing this as, as in the negative version, but for a debate, it gets confusing. So the affirmative, uh, Dr. Jen Stuber, mental health should come with a police car the co-responder model. 
Uh, so Dr. Stuber, take it away. Hey there, good morning, everybody. Um, I wanted to let you know that I'm a huge fan of this program and I'm so glad to be able to present the position mental health should come with a police car. Um, I will say that when I started my work in the area of co-response um, a year and a half ago, I actually would have responded definitely not to that debate question. And I can tell you today, I, I responded definitely yes, um, you know, in, in that debate question. So uh, in the past year, I've interviewed over 50 co-response programs across the state. I've done a huge landscape analysis of how Washington State's crisis care continuum um, is currently working. And I can tell you that there are definitely circumstances where mental health should come in a police car. Um, these are calls that require an emergency response because there's an immediate danger involved, such as someone threatening to jump off a bridge or threatening their life with a firearm. We're seeing safety has to be established. These are calls that involve a major traumatic event on the scene, such as an accident, a crash, a violent death. Um, of course, you want police there. There's a police investigation, but also because you know, you have to bring all the first responders together into a team and, and respond to that event. And of course you want behavioral health um, in that response. And then one of the things that really shocked me in my work last year was the amount of calls that were coming into 911 for people with behavioral health needs where they actually were having public safety issues. And so I absolutely want mental health in a police car going to those calls. Several domestic disputes often have a behavioral health component and of course law enforcement is going to be involved there. Um, I would also say in Washington state, we have very unique circumstances where mental health must come in a police car. We have designated crisis responders, which is the only way to have involuntary, involuntary treatment in Washington state. And we're severely understaffed with those designated crisis responders. And so the only way to get an ITA evaluation is in an emergency room oftentimes, and police are the only people who can take people to that setting. Um, we also have, I think like many states, an under-resourced system right now um, in terms of mobile crisis response, which has really meant that first responders, police, police in, in particular, have had to step up. And so I would say, you know, David mentioned that we've had this incredible uh, momentum in, in Washington state, thanks to Representative Orwall and Senator Moncadingra around funding our 90 day crisis system, which has really given us the opportunity to look at the crisis care continuum and from a very holistic stage. We started our debate around, our conversation around this, in my view, completely wrong. And I just wanna tell every state that's maybe embarking on this, we started it wrong. Like we basically started it with the debate, we don't want mental health in a police car. And that actually managed to kind of alienate our first responder community that very much needs to be part of the conversation. So on this slide here, what you see is what we would propose is a remake of um, the SAMHSA iconic diagram that really kind of is more realistic around the fact that we really do need that interoperability between 988 and 911, and that interoperability between the mobile rapid response teams and what we are doing in Washington state, which is not just focusing on law enforcement based co-response, but fire based co-response. And then of course the panoply of um, places to stabilize people, which currently don't really exist in Washington state. Um, we have some incredible things happening in Washington. Um, we actually, this session, are really looking to um, define what co-response is. And what you can see is that what we're talking about with co-response is it's not only law enforcement. By the way, a lot of the law enforcement co-response programs don't even come in police cars. Um, but we are really getting fire and EMS engaged and a whole bunch of different kinds of human service professionals engaged in addition to peers. And what's exciting to me about that is that we have the potential to really also address complex medical needs, healthcare needs for people with behavioral health crisis and behavioral health needs. So like, to me, it's like, we should be in embracing co-response, embracing the concept of that there is no wrong call for help, uh, 911, 988, if someone's in crisis, we should be embracing the fact that we should be building behavioral health capacity both within the 911 system, partnering much and more with our fire partners and within the 988 system through our mobile crisis teams. I just wanted to also show you this map here. We've mapped our co-response programs across the state. Um, you can see the blue are our, our law enforcement based co-response programs and the red are our fire-based co-response programs. We do this annually now in Washington State. We're hoping to include all the crisis services 
and then do some better coordination at that local level of the co-response and mobile crisis teams and of the 988 centers and the 911 centers. So a huge amount of potential. And I am out of time, so I'm gonna stop there. Terrific, Jed, really appreciate laying the case for. And uh, we'll now go to uh, Detective Sabrina Taylor, who is also holds the uh, record for the most times phoned a friend during the crisis trivia hot seat. Sabrina Thanks, Taylor, your five <laughs> minutes starts now. Thanks, David. Um, so the Crisis Jam audience is pretty familiar with this debate topic. We've talked about it a lot. There have been experts discussing the pros and cons. So this morning, I wanted to take a slightly different approach. Um, and I wanted to piggyback on a method that social scientists use, um, the concept of infrastructure, to sort of look at the issue in a different way. Because the infrastructure we create contains both the promises and the compromises that we have chosen to make in the past when we were building it. Um, so looking purposefully at the structure is going to show us the designs of our system, including who they give power to and who they oppress. And so it's a way of trying to make visible the causes of the causes that we're trying to address with our program so we can get to the root of things. Um, one of the most telling visualizations of our system, in my opinion, is the sequential intercept model. Um, and so if you go to the next slide, you can see an excerpt from the 2006 paper um, that was published on the use of the sequential intercept model. Um, and they note at the very, very beginning that the ultimate intercept is a robust mental health system. And then they also noted in the paper that it did not exist, um, and definitely not in any kind of way nationwide. Um, and so the only infrastructure that's available uh, to help people in crisis was the criminal justice system, which was very robust in the time, thank you to the 80s and the war on drugs. Um, and so it became the default. And historically, our criminal justice infrastructure is continually well-maintained, well-funded, very politically popular, and it, it is a incredibly easy to access system. Um, it is the one government system where if you call 911 and you say, hey, I need the police, you are going to get the police. And we've made it super easy to access, no cost to anybody to use. Um, and, and it became just a very easy infrastructure to piggyback on. And it is super easy to tack on a small addition to this existing system rather than to try to build and fund a whole new one. So putting a clinician in a cop car, um, sending co-response in this way is much, much easier than trying to create an entire um, SAMHSA model crisis system. So now, 20 years after this paper, we have to look at, you know, what infrastructure have we built? Where are we putting our budgetary resources? Um, and then a very interesting paper just came out last year from the Police Executive Research Forum, also known as PERF. Um, and they surveyed uh, almost 200 police agencies to see what, what structures are they using? What infrastructure um, are they using to support their models to respond to mental health crisis calls? And they found that a true mobile crisis response was only possible in communities where there was enough demand present, the personnel was available to staff them, and there was a healthcare infrastructure to support them. Communities that lacked any one of those elements were forced to resort to some kind of police involved response because it was the only reliable infrastructure they had. So it works for them, but it works for them because it has to, there are no other alternatives. And so for us in the community, not just police, but as a community, this is a gut check moment for us. We need to ask ourselves, what infrastructure are we intentionally supporting with our decisions? Most often when crisis comes in a police car, it's relying entirely on the criminal justice system. Behavioral health professionals are employees of the police departments that they are responding with. It, it's, it's a whole system funded by local government um, and generally falls under the umbrella of police. So we can argue over whether this is good or bad, but there is no debate about what structure you are choosing to shore up. And this is the only thing that you can expect if you're going to ask a local government to address a healthcare issue, because local government, and to some extent, even the federal government has very little direct control over what is primarily in the United States, a private healthcare system. They can affect social determinants like jobs and education, but the only infrastructure they directly control is criminal justice. And so that's what they use. And so we as a community need to have the courage to do the hard thing and start looking for 
programs and promoting programs that rebuild our failing mental health care infrastructure so that it can be a system, and this is key, designed specifically for people in mental health crisis. That way we're not piggybacking on some system that was designed for a completely separate purpose, and we design an a infrastructure and a system designed to help people in the way that is most appropriate for them. All right, and I think I'm just about out of time. So thank you, David. Uh, you have about 20 seconds, Sabrina. Any comment on this last slide? Um, that's just us building infrastructure. <laughs> great, great. Uh, so I'm going to reset my clock for five minutes of questions. Feel free to jump in the chat text if you've got something you'd like me to direct. But let me start with uh, with you, Jen. And I'm going to go back to uh, this slide that we uh, started with. So I pulled this directly off a of co-response site. Uh, Jen. And I just thought it was interesting that it's an African-American social worker, African-American guest, and two uh, white police officers that are standing over uh, the, the what looks like an interesting, engaging uh, clinical. There is this issue of race and equity that uh, we've been having a lot of discussion of since 2020. Uh, thoughts on the, the experience of, of Black and Brown individuals with this police response uh, and 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 what the impacts of co-response might be for those with mental health challenges. I think you know that's a very very valid concern, and um, it has definitely been present in a lot of the discussions we've been having in Washington State as we reform our system. Um, I think the really what we should be focusing on is the discourse needs to be on how do we minimize the use of police and behavioral health crisis response. Um, and not how do we eliminate it, because it's really not possible to eliminate it, not just because of capacity issues and certain things like, like I mentioned around our ITA statute in Washington, but because there are truly very, there are certain circumstances where you cannot not have police because of public safety issues. And even again, it, that gentleman in the, in the park may have, is sometimes the one calling 911 because he's at risk. And so you wanna be able to bring services to people. I also wanna comment that, co-response and even police-based co-response, they also play another really important valid role around follow-up care. And um, follow-up care is hugely important in the crisis care continuum. And we need both our 911 system and our 98 system to be able to provide that. And again, I, I also just wanna say that, so I think that that's really valid. And I also, and, and it's absolutely why we should be thoughtful about how we design our, our crisis care continuum and be thinking about what's the role of law enforcement-based crisis response What's the role of fire-based co-response? What where there's behavioral health needs that are and, and healthcare needs being addressed, and then also what's the role of the mobile crisis teams and the crisis response, you know, in the in the Medicaid 988 system. So I, I think that we can work this out. Like we we actually need to work it out, and we need to have 911 and 988 working with each other so that those calls are going back fluidly back and forth and that those teams can be dispatched fluidly depending on what's the unique need in the community and there should be no wrong number you call for help just like there should be no wrong door sabrina uh let's let's take the other side uh so washington state coincidentally is where marty smith was killed a social worker uh she wasn't on a mobile crisis team but she was a community mental health person in a an individual's home how do we respond to the safety of uh, community-based people in the out in uh, settings that are not secure without law enforcement? Uh, so I, you know, I, I think that's a a valid concern. Um, but you know, there's been study after study after study that shows that people with um, mental health issues and people in mental health crisis are no more diff uh, dangerous than you know your average person and more likely to be victimized. So um, they're not inherently dangerous situations. Um, and then you know there are um, you know I'm not the mobile team expert, but I my mean, mobile team partners have have consistently told me that if you go in teams of two, if you um, make sure that there is um, you know, you are near the door and that the client is not between you and the door and you have an exit exit route and you can seek safety in your car and you can call for assistance um, that, you know, those can keep people safe um, in, in the case that things go sideways. Uh, Sabrina, one more follow-up question. So the idea of these community-based mobile teams makes perfect sense if you have that capacity, but most communities don't have it. What's your reaction to that? 
I mean, some communities, as a friend of mine has uh, informed me, don't even have police, um, you know, and, and because the CIT center is so much around police, I don't, I didn't even realize that some uh, communities, all they have is rural fire, um, you know, and, and there are, you know, very frontier parts of the country that, um, that don't even have police models. But if we are, you know, if, if, if you do have police, and that is the only infrastructure that you can use, then communities are definitely going to have to use it. Um, you know, the the ways to solve these complex problems are to make sure that we bring local communities together, local stakeholders together, and co-produce from the ground up whatever model that you need to use. Um, and, and whatever they co-produce will probably be adequate for their community. It'll make a difference and it'll be helpful. Um, but you know, finding a way to to promote this um, behavioral health and this healthcare infrastructure, even in rural societies, is probably going to be the best way. And and how we can give these communities the resources they need to um, be provide compassionate and appropriate care. Jen, last question to you, and it's it's sort of the same question uh, around because it does have to do with building infrastructure. Many of the co-response teams I've seen don't have a lot of scale. They're limited hours, one or two cars. So we're back at not being able to get to the person quickly. Uh, you talked about the African-American in the picture, maybe calling 911 because they needed a response now. We also don't have that capacity. So your thoughts on that? Um, I, I, we're working on it. I mean, we literally have it going from both ends. We're working on building 911 capacity in behavioral health, and we're also working on building 988 capacity in behavioral health. And, and I think that we, again, we really have to be thoughtful about what team is needed for and under what circumstance. And we have to make sure that 988 and 911 are on the same page and that there's regional coordination, accountability, and transparency. And you all taught me that in my visits to, to um, Rhode Island. And I think we're gonna get there because we're, we've kind of gotten over the hurdle of saying, oh, no, no, no law enforcement, no matter what, because that's just not even a feasible goal. You saw the map even that I showed you. We can't even come up with the map around mobile crisis teams in our state right now. So there's something there, but you saw our map, like, yeah, there's not enough capacity. And so we have to, we are literally intentionally working on that right now and very specifically working on fire-based co-response and the role that their very unique role they can play in medication assisted outpatient treatment. Um, and the very important role they can play in addressing behavioral health needs for our seniors, you know? Yeah. Um, so Jen, so, let's, let's do yeah. a final, let's do a final minute of anything that you want to say to conclude uh, your cases. And let's start with Jen on the case four. Okay. So I guess my, my big point is there are really, the discourse really does need to shift to how do we minimize the use of police in the behavioral health crisis care continuum? Any other conversation we're not really being real about, we need to build infrastructure for behavioral health response, both within 911 and within the 988 system and be intentional about it. Just like there should be no wrong door for help, there should be no wrong door for callers who are in crisis. It's our job as crisis responders and as first responders to ensure that people with behavioral health needs get the help they need both the 988 and the 911 systems need additional behavioral health capacity. Terrific. And Sabrina, the last comments on the case against. Sure. Um, so, so yes, um, we're not going to get away from uh, police having to respond. We're still using our sequential intercept models. We're still diverting as much as possible. But uh, police intervention is still a coercive intervention. It's still using a system that was designed specifically for punitive punishment. Um, and we we desperately need a system that is designed for um, care and mental health care. And you know, the police departments have a lot of power, um, even if they don't have direct control over these systems, and they have the power to advocate for what we really need for effective mobile crisis. You know, as my um my co-presenters said, they don't, they don't have this mobile crisis in Washington. We are very, very fortunate that we have mobile crisis teams, over 30 of them in Maricopa County, that can respond in under 30 minutes or less. Um, and it's still not fast enough, but it's, it's something. Um, and we need to advocate for that. And I think putting clinicians in cop cars sometimes can distract us because it can, you know, plug the, the leaking dam. Great, great. solution. 
Uh, we have a we have a, a roundtable, but before we get to that roundtable, we do have the privilege of the founder of the Crisis Jam, Rich, Dr. Richard McKeon, to jump right in because his hand is raised. Well, thank you, David. That's kind of you. I just want to thank the organizers of the Crisis Jam and our participants in this debate for just a really incredible and important and thoughtful discussion of an issue that is too often shrouded in polemics. And I think the way that this has been phrased, which is how do you reduce police involvement, um, realizing that it's not gonna be eliminated entirely, um, and how do you build the infrastructure for that is exactly the conversations we should be having. So I wanna thank both of our debate participants who each have made such incredible contributions to suicide prevention and crisis care, as well as to um, the organizers for setting this up. This was probably your idea, David. I know you like debates. Well, I loved your debate, Richard, several years ago. Jen and Sabrina, terrific. Just loved it so much. Uh, Ron, we we let's take a just a quick minute. Uh, Ron wrote one of our most popular or was involved in one of our most popular crisis talk interviews ever about this topic. Uh, Ron, a quick minute on reflecting on the debate. Yeah, so I mean, as we start to listen to this, we really we really understand that a comprehensive crisis response system has so many different components to it. Um, let me give you an example is that I've been fortunate to be able to work with uh, an organization to re do a sample review of cases from a department, a police department, a major police department. And they realistically have almost every option available to them. So they have, first off, they do uh, CIT training for every single one of their officers. Then they have selected patrol officers that are their crisis response officers. They have embedded co-response with law enforcement clinician going out uh, together. They have embedded co-response follow-up division going out and handling calls. And they also have a community crisis response model where they have a mobile crisis outreach team that can respond independently from law enforcement. So they have it all. So what I would like to just kind of point out is we start to look at a comprehensive crisis response system, we're, we're starting to notice that there's something that we need to now pay attention to and take into consideration. And it's not we all know the importance of data collection. That's not that's not the issue. But what we now need to do is monitoring, because what we're finding is that at every single level, there's discretion. There's discretion at 911 level, whether they are going to take the call or whether they're going to do a warm handoff to crisis to a crisis line such as 988. We have the option to send out a crisis response officer, somebody that is dedicated and, and is identified as that specialist in patrol to go out and respond. We have the ability to send out non-law enforcement embedded co-response, but every one of those has discretion. So we need to monitor to make sure that the individuals that are utilizing that discretion are doing so appropriately. We can capture when we transfer a call from 911 to 988, but we can't capture it if we do not go back and do a review and say, you know what, this call would have been more appropriate and then design training around that to make sure that the 911 telecommunicators, our crisis uh, response officers all have an understanding of their role and what discretion they should utilize. Terrific, Ron, terrific. Let's go to Dr. Leah Pope. Uh, research scientist with New York State Psychiatric Institute and assistant professor at Columbia University Department of Psychiatry. Hi, everyone. Um, happy to weigh in here. And this has been um, a super informative discussion. And I really like the framing of both this idea of reducing rather than totally eliminating police involvement, as well as building infrastructure. I was just going to comment briefly on the workforce issue that I think really underlies um, this debate. And you know, I think there's broad consensus that we really don't have the workforce that we need to respond to all the behavioral health crises we're seeing in the community, right? So we don't have capacity to send master's levels clinicians to all of these community-based crises. And we also know that um, many people who could do this work um, don't want to do the work in the community, either because they don't want to go out with police because they fear their own safety, or they're talking about safety concerns, but that might be codes for not wanting to work in certain communities, um, particularly urban communities of color. 
Um, so we really have to be thinking about kind of who is doing this work and how do we build up the workforce of people who have the capacity, the skills, the competencies to respond um, to behavioral health crises, whether they go with or without police. Um, I think um, I'm working with several colleagues to um, develop kind of this idea of a new professional crisis responder, um, a community behavioral health crisis responder who could be trained and have these sorts of skills and values um, to be able to respond, hopefully without um, police wherever appropriate. Um, and I'd like to think that, you know, regardless of the debates about where they should be housed or when they should be go out, go out, um, that this sort of, you know, um, embraced workforce could really be called upon by either the mental health or law enforcement systems um, when needed. So terrific, terrific, Dr. Pope, and also hearkening back to that Bazelon article about peers in the crisis workforce. So. Uh, Pat Strode, uh, so glad to have you today. And Georgia actually is one of those areas that does. They found the workforce that Dr. Pope is talking about, both clinical and that community responder who's going out in, in tandem. They've been doing that for 10 years now across the entire state. Uh, but we also do that in partnership with the GBI and, and law enforcement. Uh, uh, Pat, your reflections. Pat, your Sorry about that. Thank you for having me. Um, I've also been asked to talk about um, what you discussed earlier, David, about equity and inclusion. Um, and uh, unfortunately, in communities of color, these are discussions that have been going on for decades. And so these are no new discussions for us. So in terms of crisis response in most of these communities, communities of color, what I'm speaking of, um, the resource we know most is 911, and calling 911 is traditionally going to generate a law enforcement response. So there are a couple of things that I think would be important as we try to develop uh, responses that are not just equitable, but that are fair, um, and where people are treated um, and the responses are, are done in the most least restrictive way um, with the greater outcome. So one is, would be, I think responders, whether it's law enforcement or 911 or whoever is going to respond, should have some sort of factual, factual knowledge about the communities they serve. Uh, does the community choose to solve their own issues? Um, is it the caller um, a child in a family where the child is the only one who speaks English? Is this a hotty police community where there is a lot of traumatic experiences? So I think these things are key for responsers to understand, is there a distrust in law enforcement? Is there a distrust in services? So just some very basic knowledge. Second, I think that responders, the call takers should be trained um, and have the ability to listen to the nuances and know how to ask the appropriate questions um, of the caller. Uh, when most people are in crises, um, they have a very difficult time articulating. So based on the person's lived experience, it may be that they have a difficult time articulating or uh, they may hold back based on the response they have gotten in the past vis-a-vis uh, -vis a law enforcement response uh, to a crisis. So having the call taker understand and being able to listen to the caller, listen to the nuances and ask the appropriate questions would help that call taker to uh, make the proper dispatch, the proper response, whether it is uh, 988, which is our preference to have a, a cl clinical response, or if it is it going to be EMS, is it going to be law enforcement, or is it going to be a combination of two or three of those? Right. Uh, the third is is just consistent and repetitive marketing education around mental illness and substance use. I think this is key. Again, we need to empower communities um, about things like 988, about the services in their communities so that they can be more proactive rather than reactive and having to rely so heavily on 911. If folks know where to go for services, I think, um, I believe uh, that they would more likely use those services than to rely on 911. And in closing, right. like many of you have said, I do think that as we build these uh, infrastructures, we need to beef up our clinical workforce, um, but also to uh, help build into that infrastructure when it is appropriate to call law enforcement, when it is appropriate to do a, have a co-responder uh, response. So all of those are important. 
Uh, and depending on the community, um, I think we the services should be uh, uh, targeted for that specific community, understanding the cultural uh, in cultural context what has happened in those communities so that we can reduce the reliance uh, on 911. Uh, and I just want to add one last thing. In Georgia, like Washington, we have passed legislation um, calling for call responder teams. So there is a trend towards that. So as we're uh, framing these discussions, I think it's critically important to also um, look at our policies and include our policy makers in on the discussion so that they're not passing legislation that is kind of going against the grain of what is really needed in communities. Thanks so much to our panel. And Tanja, just for time, we just got a couple of sentences uh, as we go, because we're what we're about to do is take that survey one more time as people reflect on this discussion. Uh, what, what, how would you like to end this uh, from your vantage point of someone who works closely with law enforcement has also been there in crisis with a law enforcement response? Okay, I'll go fast. First of all, that picture triggered me uh, for so many different reasons. I'm sitting here mad, sad, excited, open-minded. And as I think about, you know, co-responders, I get it. Uh, being military uh, police, I get it. Being a person with lived experience who had to see their mama put in the back of a police car in handcuffs who was not a threat to herself or anyone, or being someone who's had to be, you know, in that position myself. Um, I think we have to continue these conversations, but I just think about all the people who are in crisis centers who work there. Do they have police 24 hours, seven days a week? Their people are trained. Or what about treatment centers? There are people who walk through that door, their crisis. Most of them don't have law enforcement that are sitting there, you know, just in case they're in crisis. So I, I think that, you know, this calls for much discussion. I think that, you know, um, at the end of the day, we know we all need to work together. At the end of the day, I think that if we are going to have police, you know, come on the scene, you know, because we have peers going out doing that and we know how to call for backup when we need it. Most police officers know how to call for backup when they need it. So that can be the same thing. So, you know, sending someone, you know, peers like us who are highly trained, you know, with a doctor who can also PEC, you know, just like law enforcement or NP who can do that on the spot as well. But we know when we need to call law enforcement, we don't need to have, the, you know, everybody coming because that already triggers people. The other thing is, is that um, if we do have law enforcement, well, let's talk about them coming in unmarked, Step, definitely not standing, standing there, you know, with that situation right there, but unmarked cars, they can be in civilian clothes. So there are ways if we're going to do this, we can do it. We need to think it out. But at the end of the day, we need to think about what's going to trigger and what's going to help that person who's in that crisis. And so having these conversations, these debates are, 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 are amazing. We need to but I think, you know, we need to make sure that people know that because of trauma, tradition and trust and a person is in a crisis, that having law enforcement there right in the spot would just exasperate that. I've seen it too many times. And so can we coexist? Yeah. But we have to do it in a meaningful way where it's always client centered first. And like I said, don't forget about those crisis centers. Don't forget about those treatment centers who people walk through their door. They're in crisis every day. They know how to handle themselves. And so. Uh, let's just always be mindful of that. Thank you, Tanja. Okay, so Karen, let's put the uh, survey back up one final time, and then we'll compile that data while we go to the next segment. So uh, we're going to bring that survey back up. I'm not seeing it yet, Karen. Ah, there it is. I'll leave that up. Got it's like a hundred coming through. We'll let that keep keep reading. Okay, great, great. So answer that uh, if you would please. And while we're doing that, while everybody's getting to that, Dr. Belina Shaw, uh, SAMHSA update. Thanks for joining us. Belina, you... I am here. Yes, great. All right, I am here. Hello, everyone. Um, Belina Shaw, one of the senior medical advisors in SAMHSA, the Center for Mental Health Services, and uh, excited to be here and so excited about that debate. I echo Richard's sentiments around just how important this discussion is and not necessarily um, being an extreme dialectic on each side. So um, I just wanted to give a couple of sub SAMHSA updates. Um, uh, some are um, actually not as specific to crisis care, um, as centered here, but um, very important around the continuum 
and actually um, links to some of the other topics that were discussed today. Um, the first topic that I want to uh, just quickly bring up because I believe we'll have a Medicaid corner today um, with Tom Batlock is that uh, we in the Center for Mental Health Services are um, embarking upon a national site, the Academies of Science, Engineering and Math study um, to understand um, why there is not public participation um, at the, the level of other uh, fields in healthcare in public insur uh, insurance. Um, and that includes uh, Medicaid, Medicare, and the marketplace um, uh, um, plans. So there's a, a current study underway. Um, there have been some webinars, um, and we um, expect a draft report soon. Um, and, and we will be getting a brief to both uh, SAMHSA and CMS. I also just wanted to put in the chat the um, link to the site because there is an opportunity for, hmm, that doesn't, didn't work though. Nope, that's the wrong thing. Um, there is a link for um, providing public comment as well. So um, that is the first thing. The second thing um, is that just related to um, this, what was already, I think that should be able to get you there. All right. um, and the, the, that was related to the article that um, we did not plan this, but David brought up as I was gonna talk a little bit about our Black Youth Suicide Prevention Initiative um, and the Center for Mental Health Services, which includes multiple strategies, um, but some of which include um, a, a series of policy academies. Um, we held a policy academy last year with eight states, and um, we have another one planned for um, this summer. Um, we, are, we have still not uh, determined the states as of, of yet, um, but we also um, have embarked upon a learning collaborative with the states um, that um, were engaged and the exciting part is that um, we have um, over half of the states who have identified funding to work on uh, the, uh, developing out their plans, um, including Ohio with a, a million dollar, over a million dollar investment into this space. So um, just really excited about that. Um, and, and I just wanted to also um, touch on um, the, the article that David mentioned this morning um, or this afternoon. And you know about about the uh, social work piece and and about licensure. And um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm board certified in in uh, three specialties, and I um, have taken a couple of board exams. And I just and some people don't always under when we talk about the bias and tests, people don't are, it's always not always clear. So um, we actually also at SAMHSA had a, a TEP on a te uh, technical expert panel on expanding the workforce. Um, and especially the the, uh, the workforce to address um, health disparities. Um, I actually put the title in the chat before too. Um, and, and this came up and I just wanna give a couple of examples just to kind of clarify where some of the bias is in some of these tests. Um, one, uh, for my addictions boards, I had to kind of code switch and tell myself um, that, you know, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis and we're thinking about the Caucasian population and therefore, that I would, we would want to, um, uh, that I would change how I would treat this person uh, based upon uh, different than how we might have treated this person if they were an African American or say using crack cocaine in the 80s um, or 90s. So that's that's one thing. And then also just even with the mental status exam, that if someone was wearing um, say clothing that in the 90s they were wearing big 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 um, earrings, and that and the person on the on the board exam had big earrings then I um, could kind of tell myself that I think they want me to say that that person looks like they're dressed extravagantly, even though I know that was the style and that was culturally appropriate. So um, just as we think through this, this problem, um, I just want to just, just raise that. And sometimes people will say, oh, these tests are biased, but how? I did uh, fairly well on those tests, but I had to kind of code switch to mentally um, work through the bias. So um, that is, um, you know, we were working on a, a workforce plan strategy at SAMHSA, and then also just the Black Youth Suicide Prevention at large. Um, and, and we'll keep you updated about that and the NASM study. Terrific, thanks so much, Belina. Uh, let's go to our state update with Megan. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Megan Help, Chief of Staff with uh, the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. Thank you, Dr. Shaw, for your thoughts and your uh, learnings. Um, uh, I just learned so much from you when you when you speak. Um, 
also wanted to just note about the policy academies that SAMHSA is having and that collaboration across systems that is in action when those policy academies happen. And I wanted to just let everybody know that the National Dialogues on Behavioral Health uh, is going to be happening this year, Sunday, November 3rd through Wednesday, November 6th. It's gonna be at the Renaissance Arts Hotel in New Orleans, a uh, great location. And it's going to be addressing uh, the collaboration across systems, very much like what Mary Sowers was talking about last week with IDD and behavioral health and bridging those systems. So wanted uh, to highlight that and invite everybody to hold the, the dates on your calendar. Thank you. Terrific, Megan, thanks so much. We're still looking for you if you're in a state that hasn't been highlighted in crisis talk or crisis jam and uh, the work that Najmet and NAMI and others have done to drive state legislation has just been terrific. Uh, we're gonna go to Tom Betlock for a uh, Medicaid front and center. And Tom, uh, you have some New Year's resolutions for us. I do, David, can you hear me okay? Yes. So. Yes, you know, we're starting out a new year. I think it's important to, and Dr. Shaw and Sabrina have already highlighted this. So what a wonderful call it's been, love the debate. The debate highlighted, you know, the need for infrastructure, the need for system design, and what better partner to help you with that than Medicaid, right? Medicaid can provide some of that rocket fuel to really help lift a system up. Um, and so, you know, as you think about 2024 and as you think about advancing crisis system in your state, in your region, I think it's critical to really have a strategy around how are you engaging Medicaid and leveraging Medicaid as part of that conversation. And there's no better time to do that than thinking about your goals over the start of the new year. And so three things I would highlight to folks as you, as you begin this new year. One is, how are you partnering with Medicaid today? Are they around the table? Are there conversations happening as it relates to uh, engaging your state's Medicaid program? And I think there's real opportunities to bring the content from this show and other learnings around crisis systems and what's been able to be advanced in other regions and states to Medicaid programs. Medicaid programs may not necessarily understand all that's happening out there as it relates to crisis system advancement. And so as part of that dialogue and building those relationships, really bringing forward some best practices in terms of how crisis systems have evolved in other states. And then I think there's a real opportunity to partner with Medicaid and establish some clear strategies of what you wanna to try to accomplish in 2024. Medicaid agencies have been overwhelmed by unwinding. Many of them are in a better position today as a result of that process and working through that in 2023 and may actually have some bandwidth to be engaging with partners around looking at ways to build out new strategies to advance their system. And so Medicaid agencies are always looking for ways to build those partnerships. Now is a good time to engage and identify strategies, whether it's increasing rates to address the workforce issues and really thinking about that federal match that's available through that process. You know, we've, we've heard from other states in these Medicaid upfront segments from Washington, Oregon, Connecticut, where they've developed specific strategies around increasing access for things like uh, children's crisis services um, or specific strategies around how to work more specifically through managed care organizations like Idaho highlighted um, in this section earlier in 2023. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of opportunities. Uh, you know, it was also mentioned about data. Medicaid's a great platform by which to continue to build data to look at how a crisis system is performing. But there's so many different strategies that can be pursued. I would encourage you all as, as stakeholders that are trying to grow the capacity of your crisis systems to work with Medicaid and come up with specific strategies that you want to advance in 2024. Great, Tom, thank you so much. I uh, love the threads of the SAMHSA update from Belina and Najbid from Megan and now from our New Year's resolutions from Tom. Uh, Joanna, we have a, a couple of minutes for a, a federal update. All right, thank you, David. Yeah, we can uh, jump back into our federal updates. This is the first federal update of the year. Uh, it's just me today, Sarah will be back next month, but we can report that Congress averted a shutdown um, and passed another continuing resolution. 
Um, again, this is the stopgap budget that keeps the government open um, to sort of buy Congress a little more time to create a full fiscal year budget. Um, this pushes off the FY24 appropriations deadline to March 8th uh, for the labor HHS subcommittees uh, into which crisis services fall. So that's the committee that we always focus on and, and have the most um, uh, investment in, um, in terms of tracking and keeping up to date. So hopefully we'll have some updates for you on an FY24 budget uh, soon, but we'll see, we'll see. We have until March 8th now. <laughs> so also on the federal horizon, uh, we've had some new bipartisan legislation introduced in the crisis care world. Uh, Senators Cornyn and Cortez Masto introduced uh, the Medicare Mobile Crisis Improvement Act. So we're just talking about Medicaid reimbursements and, and payment rates and stuff like that. This would be uh, Medicare payment rates, uh, making them better for mental health services that are delivered by mobile response units. Uh, I'll drop the link um, to the bill into the chat so that anyone can um, take a look and I'll share the press release from the sponsors, which also includes a link to the bill text for anyone who wants to read it. Uh, but David, that's what we have. So I'll hand it back to you. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Joanna. And back to that um, infrastructure building that uh, Sabrina and, and Jen both talked about uh, at the outset. Uh, so we republished a crisis talk from uh, from uh, some time ago, um, uh, Steph from yeah. Paolo. Uh, but there were a couple of comments you thought this was a particularly appropriate given today's uh, discussion. So uh, maybe a minute, uh, Steph, on just a quick comment uh, relative to uh, Paolo's article. Yeah, that sounds great. So yeah, we republished uh, the article uh, interviewing Paolo De Vecchio. He's the director of SAMHSA's Office of Recovery. And he shared that 28 years ago, he was the very first person at SAMHSA to self-identify as a person with a mental health history. Um, and he spoke with us also on March 8th. He did a lived lens, and I think it would be great uh, for people to check that out as well. Um, it's better to hear it from his own vantage point than me sharing his vantage point. But what he said to me in the interview was that, Historically, mental health crisis care in the US has left people and family members without choice, which makes law enforcement and the emergency room the default uh, responder and provider, respectively. He said, when in crisis, I've been responded to by police officers, restrained and taken in the back of police cars, feeling shame, fear, and pain. What I felt from my own experience and that of many of my peers is that we need a major whole scale transformation of how mental health and substance use urgent care is delivered in this country. And while I think this debate has been phenomenal, I think hearing from people how they've navigated this and what it felt like to them is so vital to the conversation. Thanks, David. Oh, thanks so much, Steph. So let's let's get the, to the results. Uh of this debate, and this was razor thin. Uh, so mental health should come with a police car co-responder. Uh, this is the both the pre and the post, and you can see that the lion's share of this community answered that question no, and Detective Taylor was able to increase the no's by maybe a couple of people, it looks like. Uh, but overall, uh, Dr. Jen Stuber moves some people uh, out of the definitely no's and the don't knows into the yeses and definitely yeses. So uh, we started at a baseline of 2.3, just slightly higher than no. It didn't move a lot, uh, but Jen gets the, the photo finish uh, by moving this audience, which started way on Sabrina's side, moved it a little bit. So, but this was rich, uh, really great discussion. Jen, quick, uh, just a sentence or two uh, going through the discussion day, anything that you reflect on? Thanks for the conversation and the opportunity to share what's happening. And I'm looking forward to keeping this conversation going. It's really critical. Sabrina. I'm just happy to be part of the jam, David, and all the work that's happening here. Um, I mean, and I know we're headed in the right direction. So thanks for having us. Well, uh, look, we are building infrastructure and the uh, continuous state and federal focus, political will, passion and funding of this uh, is like uh, none we've ever seen. So look forward to more rich discussion.
discussion on this topic. We're hoping to do a similar debate. It's not the next one, but the one after that will get into the use of peers within those crisis receiving centers. So we had a couple of folks, I think Tanja in particular, talk about crisis receiving centers that get people dropped off all the time from police. Some states don't want to use peers in those settings. There's a philosophy around this and others do it every day. So we'll have more discussion of that. Look forward to that in another debate. And if you'd like to do, Jen and Sabrina were amazing. Uh, so they've set the bar high, but if you'd love to join in us, let us know. Uh, the Global Leadership Exchange is meeting in June, and we hope that uh, you will uh, join us. Uh, Najbet is going to partner with us and more to come on that. Next week, Maureen Boyle on highlights of ASAM criteria. We wanna focus on substance use this year. We're thrilled to have uh, that topic. And in two weeks, Jonathan Thomas from Franklin County. Uh, Kevin Curtis presented on this spectacular Salt Lake City Crisis Receiving Center that the Huntsmans are funding. Columbus, Ohio is, is, uh, has a $65 million community bond for a similarly fantastic model that we'll see in two weeks. Uh, again, thanks to Sabrina and Jen and everyone who joined, and we'll see you next time on the Crisis Jam.